Okay, so I grew up in, um, for the most part, when I was age seven, we moved to Westchester County, to Pleasantville, New York. And my father, both my mother and father came from working class backgrounds. They were the first people in their family to go to college. So my father grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania, in, um, in, in Lancaster County, and he uh, must have been pretty smart. Uh, got, a, got a chance to go to Franklin and Marshall, got a, a college degree, and then he went to NYU to get a PhD in the sciences, in chemistry and physics. And then he met my mother, who uh, grew up in New York and had gotten a degree, a, a, just a four-year degree at NYU. They got married. Um, they had me in 1939. They were still living in New York City in the, in the village. So um, I don't know when my conscious awareness of the world, you know, when you're a kid, you, you're not aware of stuff around you. You're like, you know, you, you kind of live your life. You're, you feel you're, you're surrounded by people who care about you and who guide you and that kind of thing. So um, anyway, okay, so we moved to Pleasantville. My father was the head of a laboratory there. Um, and um, there were a lot of kids. What they did is they converted the Manville estate, the Tommy Manville estate, to apartments and houses. So we lived in a house. They converted the stables into apartments for young engineers and their families. So there were a lot of people around, some of whom were pretty liberal. Um, there was a, I had a Mexican godmother who lived in one of those apartments, and we lived in a house just a, you know, a stone's throw up the hill. Um, and um, I love my Mexican godmother. This is probably the first awareness that I had of otherness, of difference. I loved Lucy, and my mother was very anti-Lucy. I mean, she, and, and I don't know if I remember that how she put down my father's family, which was a farm family in rural Pennsylvania, who, and they spoke what my, to my mother, she said they spoke broken English. Well, they were kind of half German, half English in their speaking. And, you know, they were, they were low, low income. They probably would have been considered pretty poor. They had a little farm and um, they had chickens and stuff like that. We would visit them a couple times a year. And, but my mother was always very disparaging toward anybody who was different, anybody who was an other. She talked about people she grew up on her block in Flushing. Um, she was very anti-black. And so I grew up loving my godmother and thinking, not clear about what this was all about, why, why d people who were different. And I was curious and I was, you know, very aware and alive. And even my mother would criticize these engineers and their families. And she always thought they were part of the Communist Party. They were probably Democrats, you know, <laughs> big D Democrats, right? But she wasn't making a distinction there. Um, so I kind of go, I go to high school. I go to elementary school and high school in Pleasantville. And then I went to Skidmore College in upstate New York. And I start there in the fall of 1956. So, and I'm not sure that I was aware of like the Montgomery bus boycott or Brown v. Board of Education. I'm not sure uh, what I remember from that time of that, those historical events. I do remember sitting in front of the TV when I was in high school and watching the Army McCarthy hearings and hearing my mother vent against communists and people, you know, uh, infiltrating our country and all of that. And she was in love with, um, with Senator McCarthy and thought he was he was the bomb. And my father, because his work was partly in the defense industry, he, um, he was also very anti-communist, very anti-communist. And, you know, it was like there, somebody was hiding under every bush. So I, that wasn't my nature to be suspicious of people. It wasn't my nature to be, um, it was more my nature to be curious and to like, what, what's this all about, right? So I go to Skidmore. I was going to be a math major uh, because my father, who was a scientist, kept saying, oh, women in math, that's really important. Uh, I didn't like the professor. There was one woman professor who I didn't like. So I switched to psychology. And uh, when I was a sophomore, I switched my major to psychology. 
At the end of my sophomore year, I ran for student body secretary. So I lost. And this is probably the beginning of my political journey. I lost, and a woman came up to me. Uh, her name was Joan Marcus, and she said, would you like to run for National Student Association vice president, vice chairman? And I said, what's that? NSA, what's that? Didn't know what that was. And she said, oh, it's an organization of student body officials around the country. You get to go to a conference every year. I'm like, oh, conference, that's great. So I ran and I won. And then I went to Ohio Wesleyan in the summer of 58 um, to the National Student Congress. And this is really the beginning of my political awareness and journey. And I found students who were there, maybe Casey Hayden was there, maybe Connie Curry was there. I don't know if they were exactly at that one, but they were doing the student, the, the student, Southern Student, uh, Southern Student SS, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a, it was a, a meeting where black and white Southern students had a space where they could have conversation and they could dialogue about, about racial justice. Uh, although we didn't call it racial justice then, we called it desegregation or integration. <coughs> so, uh, so anyway, I came back to Skidmore, I changed my major to political science, or government as it was called. Um, I heard uh, debates about apartheid in South Africa, Al Lowenstein was there and he had, I think, traveled to South Africa and he talked about the abysmal conditions and the separate, 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 uh, separate worlds and how that was connected also to the south of the U.S. So there was all of that ferment. And there were then there were also revolutionary movements in Africa that I was very attracted to. I'm like, wow, look at all this stuff that's happening in the world. So I, like I say, I came back to Skidmore. I changed my major to government. And then I had this network of people, of National Student Association people. And so when issues came up that were important, this is fall of 58 now, uh, 58, 59 school year. So when issues came up that were important to students, there was a network. I think we got, we didn't get phone calls because we, who had phones? Then you had a dormitory phone uh, on your floor, but then, um, then we had uh, paper. So there were mailings that were sent encouraging you to do different things. So there was, uh, I'm trying to think 58, 59, I don't know that there was any particular issue. But 59, 60, then the summer of 59, I got to go to University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana for the National Student Congress. And that again was just as exciting and exhilarating and st meeting students from all over the country who cared about these issues, cared about revolutions, cared about democracy, because that was another thing. I had already figured out that the United States was not really cracked up to be the democracy that the founding fathers I, that I thought the Founding Fathers had imagined, which I didn't learn until later, maybe in, in, in graduate school, even the contradictions in the Constitution and the, the fact that white men with property were the first ones to, to be able to vote and nobody else was allowed to and that kind of thing. But, but anyway, I was very imbued with this whole idea that you know we live in a democracy and people can be in charge of their own lives and people can vote and you know so forth and so on. So, so anyway, in the fall of 59, one of the big issues was the National Defense Education Act loyalty oath. And those of us on campuses were encouraged to do some, uh, in this, this is actually early spring of 60, those of us on campuses were encouraged to do postcards, send postcards to our congressional representatives. So that was like my first uh, meeting of, you know, how do you do uh, advocacy? How do you fight for your principles through writing to your congressional representatives? So I set up with, oh, oh, and I forgot this step in there. The, the, the fall of the spring of 59, I ran for student body president and I lost the same woman that I lost student body secretary to the year before. And then I ran for National Student Association chairman on campus and I won. So I went to the Champaign-Urbana conference and then came back to campus. And then, you know, very dutifully, I was kind of a dutiful person. You know, if they said, do this, I'm like, okay, we gotta do this, right? So we set up a table, I remember, in the student union and had people sign cards uh, to oppose this loyalty oath. 
And of course, in a very, a very rudimentary way, my attitude was, well, if you're a communist, you're evil and you're going to lie. So you're going to sign the loyalty oath. So the only people that are not going to sign it are the pure Democrats who believe in individual freedoms, who are not going to, um, who are, who are going to, on principle, not so, sign a loyalty oath. So the good people are going to be the ones that lose the right to their scholarships, etc. Not the bad people. That's not the way we get the bad people. So <laughs> anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing at how, how. Um, how simplistic our, our understandings were at the time. So then the sit-ins happened, February 1st, 1960, and I'm shocked. I'm like, what? Black students can't sit at lunch counters? I mean, I'd had some exposure through NSA to the segregation system in the South, but I don't think I really understood how it was impacting people, because it was more theory, it was more conversation and that kind of thing. So the sit-ins happen, I'm shocked. This is not the country I thought I lived in, not the country I thought I was fighting to preserve, um, et cetera. So then uh, we, we start meeting at Skidmore and we had all these big debates and discussions and uh, how to, the, okay, the other pieces of course were very, Skidmore being kind of a second rate Ivy League um, girls college, right? We're very sensitive to the fact that Smith and Holyoke and Wellesley and Vassar are having support demonstrations for the Southern students. So we're like, oh my God, we got to get into the action. So we organize a, a picket at the local Woolworths in downtown Saratoga, Saratoga Springs uh, at the end of March. So by from between February and uh, February 1 and March, whatever it is, 20th or so, there is hundreds of hundreds, literally hundreds of sit-ins that have percolated across the South. In fact, we organized this picket at, well, first we have these big town hall meetings and two and 300 students show up at these meetings and everybody's debating and discussing. I mean, it's my first experience with anything like this. It's so fabulous and you're so alive. You're like, oh my gosh, what are the arguments pro and con? And you're hearing things. Well, I also started getting some hate mail in my dorm. I got these threatening notes, go home if you like niggers, you know, that, that kind of thing. I got some letters from off campus from people who ascribed to the Klan, who said I was a race mixer, etc. I'm like, I'm like, whoa, I'm learning all this stuff. So anyway, we, we organized this picket, 200 women out of a 1,200 uh, student body go on this uh, march. We march from the campus downtown, we march once around the shopping center and then we come back. And, and actually in the Skidmore history books, there are pictures of the, of the picket and the signs and that kind of thing. So, um, so we come back to campus and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a senior this year and the other two women that helped me organize this are both seniors as well. The one black student on campus at the time and a Jewish student from Chicago who was the editor of the newspaper. So the three of us are kind of the lead people. Um, so the sophomores are gather on the corner and they say, we can't stop, we have to keep going. So uh, they then, um, we agree, okay, four students at a time will go downtown and pick at the Woolworths. So the first four students who go downtown are arrested by the Saratoga Springs police and they're arrested under an old union busting statute that says you can't pick it you can't, within certain feet of, a, of an establishment type of thing. So you begin to learn about civil liberties, civil rights, you begin to learn all this stuff through your own experience. So the police, uh, the one of the young women was, uh, her father was a lawyer, and she knew you didn't have to give your name until <clears throat> you were actually charged with a crime. <clears throat> so she, she had them put their hands over their eyes like this, and. Uh, refused to get their pictures taken, right? And then the headline in the newspaper was the four women with their hands over their eyes, the Saratoga Springs newspaper, and it said skiddies more than they bargained for. You and one of the four and women. no, no, I wasn't one of the four. No, it was four sophomores that went okay. down. And then the um, the the police bring the four women to the president's office. He reads us the riot. We come to the president's office. He reads us the riot act. Spring break is the next day, so then actually everything kind of cools down. But what we learned about our own right, our own First Amendment freedoms through that, right? You can't do X and Y and Z because 
we have laws against that. So you begin to you begin to learn that in order to really live the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and democratic freedoms, you have to fight to change things. So, so okay. So we go home for spring break. Um, I, I'm going to make it and make this kind of short because um, it's getting into a lot of detail. So, um, so I, we go home for spring break. We come back. We graduate. Then I go for the summer to the International Student Relations Seminar, which it turns out this is a whole other story, which somebody should write. Well, somebody did write. There's a book, uh, but but uh, uh, the CIA runs this this operation. And it's grooming young people to become CIA agents. But we're, we don't know that. We're innocent because we think we're the National Student Association. So I go to this ISRIS, uh, one of two women who goes to the ISRIS. And then in the fall, I go to California to sell tours to Europe for NSA. Uh, mainly because I had a boyfriend at that point who was at University of California. I mean, again, you, a lot of your decisions in this era as a young woman are made because of your, who, who you're connected to, you know, who your boyfriend is, right? So you're not very independent, right? So I go to Berkeley. There's an office in Oakland. I travel up and down the West Coast selling these tours to Europe in about um, uh, maybe, I don't know, oh, I think January maybe, I get a call from from Philadelphia that the president of NSA needs a, uh, an assistant and would I come back to Philadelphia and run the student congress which is that summer at the University of Wisconsin so I agree I moved to Philly in the in January or February of 1961 we're talking about and then I run the congress that's at Wisconsin and that Wisconsin is SDS and the liberal study group and all the again debate foment discussion very vibrant. There's uh, international students that NSA f uh, brings to the U.S., Algerian students who are making a revolution in Algeria. So there's all this alive, foment, etc. So then I go to California. I enroll as a graduate student at Berkeley in the fall of 1961. Okay. So um, there is an entity. Well, first of all, this is the fall of 61, so Macomb, Mississippi is happening. And Paul Potter and Tom Hayden from SDS are traveling to Mississippi and they're writing these long missives. They're fabulous, actually, describing what's happening and so on. So I'm on their mailing list, right? I'm in California. Another woman and I started an SDS chapter in Berkeley. But I take these long written documents about Macomb around to all these radicals, all these socialists and communists that are gathered at the University of California Berkeley campus, right? And I go to them and I say, look, we got to do something. We got we to gotta get involved. We've got to be part of this. And they look at me like I'm friggin' crazy. I mean, they're like, well, we're too busy. You know, you do something. So that led to me starting a, a small group on the campus. It was called the Provisional a committee for civil rights, something like that. Uh, it's in my hands story. I think I resurrected the name of it. I'm not sure. But anyway, so we start fundraising and publicizing like letters to Congress, calls to Washington, whatever it is that SNCC is asking us to do. In the meantime, there's something called the Southern Student Freedom Fund. And I don't think anybody's written about this either. So um, this is uh, something that is a, it's a coalition or it's a conglomerate of SNCC, Northern Student Movement, SDS, uh, Young Christian Students, which is another national group of, of young religious students, I think Catholic. Um, yeah, I think those were the four groups, SDS, YCS, NSM, and SNCC. And all over the country, campuses are being organized to support the work that SNCC is doing in the South. So there's money, we're raising money, we're sending clothes, we're sending books, we're sending, we're doing all kinds of political things, we're having demonstrations at FBI offices. So one thing I can remember, we had a, a demonstration at the Berkeley FBI office. Um, Chico Neblet was there and his brother had just been arrested and so uh, well, the Freedom Singers came to sing, and that was another thing that we did. The Freedom Singers and uh, 
um, field workers travel the country meeting with audiences, both wealthy people who could write bigger checks and then student audiences to share the story of what was happening in the South. So at one point we had the Freedom Singers come, I think that was in October of 63 maybe, um, and, and, uh, and then we went and we demonstrated at the Berkeley FBI office. Um, and I have pictures still of, of, uh, of Chuck, you know, with his sign saying my brother was arrested and Selma and the FBI just stood by, something like that. So that, again, you know, again, you're learning about the institutions by your, by your involvement with the students who you've met and who you care about and so on. In the meantime, I'm in touch, because I'm fundraising and I'm sending money, we, we are fundraising, not just me, and we're sending money to Atlanta, I'm in touch with both Casey Hayden, who's in Atlanta at the time, and Jim Foreman. And we're, we're, we're talking on the phone sometimes, we're corresponding, we have letters back and forth. And at one point, Jim says to me, I want you to come to the Howard Conference in November of 63. And I'm like, oh, well, that would be great. I'm coming east to see my parents for Thanksgiving. I have a plane ticket from them, so I, I come home. And then I go to DC to, um, to be part of the SNCC meeting in DC in November of 63. And actually, I, uh, the Library of Congress has a fabulous tape that a friend of mine sent me of uh, Jim Foreman welcoming everybody to the, to the meeting. And I don't remember being in the room when he welcomed him, but he's calling off. He was a master of finding people and instilling a passion for action. And so he's calling out people's names. He's saying, this person is here. Betty Garman is here. She's from the West Coast. She's been doing all this fundraising. And Dottie Zellner is here. And she's been doing this and that. And Janet Moses is here. Janet Jamont, et cetera. Well, whoever was on this tape. But it's a fabulous tape of just, you get the flavor of Jim's amazing organizational ability and of his commitment and of his also appreciation of people's energies, what they're, what they're uh, about to contribute. So I go to the meeting in November of 63. I fall in love with the, with the movement. I mean, I, I'm like, meantime, back in Berkeley, graduate students in political science and I have done a study, an intellectual study, of social movements in the U.S. And what we've concluded, we looked at the, the farm labor parties, we looked at the muckrakers, we looked at the uh, we looked at everything. We looked at, at the abolition movement. We looked at the women's suffrage movement. We looked at everything. We looked at the Garveyites. We looked at, um, I don't remember all the movements we looked at, but we read something and then we would discuss. And one of the conclusions we came to is that the African-American community was the only community that had not, not only achieved the gains that it was demanding and insisting on, but it was the only community that maintained a passion for freedom and justice, whereas the other movements, even including the labor movement, had kind of sold out, that white workers had gotten their due, they'd gotten their money, and then they went back into the woodwork. But black people had continued, and, and I think that says something about, in reflecting now about what we know about white supremacy and what we know about the insistence of the black community going back to things like the colored conventions in the in the 1820s and 30s and going into the, looking at the abolition movement and looking at the fight against Jim Crow and all of the things that have uh, marked the, the passion and persistence of the black community for real justice. So to me, this was kind of what we, this was kind of like what we were touching on as graduate students, but it was pretty darn superficial. But I think, and then the other thing that was happening there was this whole idea that you couldn't, that you had to leave the ivory tower, you had to leave the, the university in order to really experience, um, as a political scientist anyway, you had to leave the ivory tower to be a part of the real world, right? So uh, to me, so I left before I got my master's. Um, I'd done all the coursework. I was trying to figure out PhD or master's or whatever. But anyway, Jim and others said, come south, come and join us. I think they probably knew that they were gonna need people for, the, for Freedom Summer, which was probably just percolating at the time, maybe, maybe not. Um, and then, but he also had seen the commitment that those of us who he recruited 
he had seen our commitment in our local work to raise money and to, to be active and so on. So he said, why don't you come south and join us? So I went back to school. I finished the semester. And then I, went, I traveled across the country on a train in March of 64 to join the SNCC staff in Atlanta. When you got to Atlanta, who was the first person you met? Probably Jim Foreman. I imagine Jim. I don't remember exactly. I mean, I remember the people like William Porter and, and McRae and um, all the people who were the worker bees. I was more in the worker bee um, group. Like I, I did, you know, I was, I was very... Um, I was very much a take that assignment and do it and do it the best way you know how to do it. So if somebody says do this, I didn't really question it, but I would do it. So I, I, I don't remember. I don't. Re I know <laughs> Judy has a great story that she tells every time we do a a, yes. a presentation for hands about seeing Jim at the top of the steps, and uh, I won't re recount it because she probably has it in her interview. But uh, <laughs> but um, I don't remember. I know I somehow I get from the train station to uh, an apartment that was kind of like a Freedom House that was way out Hunter Street, like way, way, way out Hunter Street. I don't remember much about that. Um, and, but I remember the office. I mean, I remember the steps and walking up the steps and seeing kind of uh, tables around the office and different sections. There was a printing operation that, that Mark Suckle, that Julian overseed because he was the communications person. And then there, were, there was Mark Suckle, and there was John Else, and there was William Porter, and Willie McRae, and all of those folks that were part of, the, um, part of that operation. And uh, then we had the Northern Coordination, which was Dinky at the time, Dinky Romilly, who then married Foreman. Um, so Dinky and myself were the Northern Coordinators, and then when she left, I took over. The, she, uh, what happened is I went to Greenwood for the summer. I believe Dinky stayed in, in, uh, in Atlanta. And then when I, when, she, when I came back from the summer, she had gone to New York. And so I took over the Northern Coordinator role. I was in awe of Julian. I mean, he was, I was all with my impressions, my recollections are he was always talking to a reporter and we would gather around in the office and there would be a reporter like Claude Sitton or somebody who would come and Julian would always be, you know, explaining and, and, and elaborating on the conditions in this particular county or this particular organizing drive, whatever it was. And I was in, I think I was in awe of Julian. That, that was my it, and I knew him in the sense that we had a collegial relationship, but I don't remember feeling ever feeling close to him or feeling like we were good buddies. I mean, we all had tremendous respect for each other and we worked 18, 20 hours. I mean, we worked, we worked hard and we were so committed. Can you speak to how SNCC built a relationship with the media of the day and sort of how that played into the importance of the movement? Uh, yeah, I, I think the key thing was that we built relationships with everybody external to SNCC. In other words, we built relationships with people on campuses, we built relationships with donors, we built relationships with people in the community, the shopkeepers, the restaurant owners, and Julian built relationships with these media people who were rightfully and TV uh, personalities too. And I don't remember who that, but I remember the coverage was intense of the sit-ins, of, of the Freedom Days in, in Greenwood, of the, of the marches, of, the, uh, of all of the events. So there had to be one, a, a, a connection between, you had, the media people had to know that something was going on to be invited so that they were in, so you had to have their names and their numbers and you had to have um, somebody intentionally call them and reach out to them and say hey come on and you know once they had your number or they knew where you were then they could come and say hey we'd like to interview you how about talking to us about x or y but the relationship in all organizing building those relationships whether it's supporters and allies whether it's donors whether it's people that you want to turn out for an event or whether it's the media, you build those relationships 
you keep a Rolodex. We had Rolodexes in the day. I don't know whether Julian had a Rolodex, but that's what we used to call them. You keep those numbers, and so you're able to say, oh my gosh, I have to go and call Claude Sitton and fill him in, or I have to go and call Jack Nelson and fill him in, or I have to call NBC or ABC, or, or just the same way that SNCC people built relationships with Burke Marshall and John Doerr and people in the Justice Department and so that those people could be called, those people offered their numbers up so you knew how to reach them. You didn't, it wasn't like a mystery, like you, you, you built a personal relationship and a friendship on some level and, a, and also a political relationship in that you were, the, the people that you talked to got the issue and they, they like with the donors, like building, we built this Friends of SNCC network around the country, some on campuses and some were offices in northern cities staffed by SNCC, mem SNCC staff members, and some were just um, places where people uh, rose up and they said, oh, we want to do this, we'll form a committee, we'll start raising money for you, we'll have the Freedom Singers come, we'll, we'll plan a party for a field worker or whatever, or we'll go to the, to the federal building and we'll pick it, or we'll go to the FBI office and we'll pick it. So it was, the movement was so intense in that period that you could mount a national response to something basically overnight. I mean, I mean similar to the Black Lives Matter movement uh, uh, post-Ferguson in, in August of 2014, there were people popping up in cities across the country who got the issue, who saw the need to organize, who stepped forward, who, who did it. And the same with the, the media and the, and the people who wanted to support this new movement and who were attracted to the bravery of the SNCC field workers, for example. The fact that SNCC was actually organizing in communities with grassroots people and not with ministers and, you know, uh, preachers and that kind of thing. Um, so that was attractive as well because ordinary people were engaged and involved. And so imagine the uh, Claude Sitton interviewing Fannie Lou Hamer and how he must have, you know, how he must have felt to get to know Fannie Lou Hamer because she had relationships also with, with those media folks. And that was, that was also partly Julian's doing was that he, it wasn't like he was the center, it was the organizing work was the center of the stories that, that were offered to the, to the media for coverage. So, so yeah. Can, you talk, yeah. can you talk a little bit more about the Friends of SNCC program? Whose idea was it? How was it built? And how important was it to sustaining the organization and, and building support for the movement? within the South and nationwide? So the Friends of SNCC was probably Jim Foreman's brainchild. And um, I imagine, I don't, I don't remember when it first came into being, like with that name, and whether we, I think we did have Berkeley Friends of SNCC in 62, 62 and 63. So the concept was certainly there before I got to Atlanta. And the concept was that there were all these incredible people who wanted to support the movement organizing who had a role to play. And we didn't see them as like separate and um, you know not as important. We, Jim and Foreman's vision was to nurture these organizations and these connections. And so I think he's the one, on some level he got connected early on and I'm not quite sure through what process. And nobody's actually written about this whole fundraising arm of SNCC. But, um, you know, there's there's little bits and pieces so of it. Yeah, right? well, there's little bits and pieces in different books and different people like myself or Casey or others who who played a role in Friends of SNCC, but uh, or people who were northern uh, supporters who were either in the Detroit office or the New York office or the Chicago office or the or the uh, San Francisco office. But but again, I believe it's it was. Foreman's understanding that what we were about was really a radical transformation of the country and that in order to do that we had to have money. So I think in any organizing relationships are the the kind of key and that you don't necessarily build a relationship of a hundred 
of, uh, of total unanimity. Like, you, you know, you believe in conversation, you believe in a back and forth, you believe in people asking you tough questions, but you build a relationship that goes beyond just the, the strict Julian Bond is the communications director and Claude Sitton is the New York Times reporter. You, you build a relationship that goes deeper than that. So I go, I take the train across the country in March of 64. Uh, I'm uh, in Atlanta. I participate in a number of the staff meetings and big debates about whether we should be in Mississippi, whether we should bring all these students down. I was kind of feeling my way to understand what the tensions were and what the anger was and the, 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 the fear and the um, concern about bringing all these white students into Mississippi. So um, I go to Oxford in June from Atlanta, Oxford, uh, Ohio, Ox Oxford, Ohio uh, yes, oh. um, and there are two weeks of training. So some of the volunteers come the first week, more volunteers come the second week. So my role there is to build relationships with these folks who we've, you know, and again, Dottie Zellner can talk about this because she was in the Boston office figuring out who would be accepted as a volunteer and who wouldn't be. But one of the things we did was we had people fill out their hometown newspaper, their hometown connections, their congressional representatives, their state legislative people. So we had this idea that we could build around the people coming to Mississippi, bringing, in other words, bringing the country to Mississippi, we could then have that volunteer be the person who then translates the conditions in Mississippi back to their hometown. And so that was, the, that was a very conscious pro part of the process. And so the Greenwood office was established as a way to be connected with all of the volunteers coming from the north. Um, after Oxford, Ohio, two weeks in Oxford, we all take a bus, I think, don't remember, uh, to, to Mississippi. And we set up the national office in Greenwood at 708 Avenue N. And each of us lives with a family in the community. And you know, the, 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 the most um, deepest memory I have of that is that I was given the only bedroom in the house. I'm like this guest from the north and I'm given for the summer, I'm given the couple's bedroom and they're sleeping in the, in the living room. I mean, it's just, and one of the things I carried with me for many years was, was I, was I um, appreciative enough? Did I thank the family enough? Did I understand their sacrifice? Did I just, did I, how did I, how did I, how did I act? Was I, was I, you know, was I just in my own little bubble going back and forth to the office? It was like two blocks away. So I would, often we would work into the night. We had different shifts. The, the office was very rudimentary. It was, um, you know, a bunch of desks, probably, you know, we probably scarfed up some desks from somewhere, I don't know, around a big open space. Luckily, it was a brick building, and so when the Klan shot into it in the summer of 64, um, there was a brick wall that separate, and then there was a, a, a kind of a, a foyer area and then another brick wall. So when the Klan shot into it, it, the bullets never reached us in the interior of the office. Um, we had a Watts line. So a Watts line was wide area telephone service, uh, kind of like the 800 numbers of today, which they didn't exist at the time. The way the Watts line worked is you had to make the call from the origination place. So the field would call us and they would say, I'm, uh, this is a person to person call, it's for Betty Garman. Um, and then we would say, whoever answered the phone, or even if I answer the phone, well, she's not here. Can I take a number and call you back, have her call you back? And then we would write the number down and then boom, we would dial the Watts line number into the, into the field office. And, but we did that every morning, we called every office around the state. So all of us did that. Dottie did it, Judy did it, Julian did it when he was in, in Greenwood, although he was mostly in Atlanta, if I remember. But we would compile a Watts report and that's been printed in some of the that's in some of the archives, and it says, you know, we called Itabina, we called um, we called Greenville, we called Hattiesburg, we called Macomb, we called um, 
wherever it was, and then we would document what had happened overnight, whether anybody was arrested, whether they were planning a Freedom Day, whether they were carrying people down to, to register to vote that, that day, um, all of those kinds of things. Whether the, they needed bail money, that was another thing we needed to raise money for was bail money because there were so many people arrested and we had to post bail. Um, so yeah, and then you also built, that was another piece of it, you built relationships with the local black lawyers. And sometimes white lawyers would step up, but mostly it was local black lawyers and you had to, and local black ministers too. Sometimes you had to really spend time talking with them to get them to step out of their comfort zone, to, to take some risks with allowing us to use their church for mass meetings because the retaliation was so intense. So you, you had to, you had to build those relationships and build that, that trusting sense with everybody. So in Mississippi, I can remember the restaurant was named Bloods and uh, we would, Mr. Blood, you know, generally treated us as, as I remember, I had $9.64 and I remember using that for cupcakes and cigarettes and, you know, snacks. I don't remember, although I'm sure that whatever money I had left over, I, you know, I gave over to Mr. Blood when we ate there, but we ate our share of, you know, fabulous greens, smothered, smothered pork chops, fried chicken, all of that, right? And maybe only once a day, maybe that, maybe that was all we ate, right? I don't, I don't, rem those are the details you don't remember. You remember the calling the projects and calling the North and encouraging people to demonstrate or to send money or to call the Justice Department in DC or to you know rail against the FBI because they were so in bed with the local officials, the local white supremacist officials. So yeah, so that, but the rhythm was different in, in uh, the summer of 64. One, because the work was so much more intense and so there was something happening every single day, every moment. And there were a lot of people coming to Mississippi not only northern uh, like lawyers and and medical committee for human rights people and so on but there were but there were also um you know like harry belafonte and sydney portier came at one point to greenwood i can remember them shaking in their boots and jim foreman meeting them and bringing them into greenwood and having conversation with them and i don't remember i think they stayed overnight but they were terrified they were like really worried that something you know, untoward was going to happen to them. So you had that, and so the pace and the momentum was just enormous. And then we were preparing for the Democratic Party challenge in, in Atlantic City. So again, you were working around the clock, et cetera. So one difference, there were a couple differences for me. One was um, that I wanted to be in the field. It was the first time that I was close enough to the field work that I felt I wanted to be out there canvassing or talking to people. And often the whites in, in SNCC were not the people, main people who went into the field. The, with the white summer volunteers, yes, many of them did go into the field or they worked alongside the black um, uh, field, the black project staff, which would be a combination of local people and maybe a college student, maybe a Frank Smith, maybe a, a somebody from, uh, from Nashville, somebody from Fisk or somebody from Howard. C certainly there were a lot of Howard students, uh, Charlie Cobb, the Cortland Cox, Stokely, and they were all pretty much project directors. So they would be the lead people in a local area. Stokely was the project director in Greenwood. And then there were white volunteers. And I can remember saying, I want to go out and canvas. I want to get people talked, talked into going to vote, to register to vote, et cetera, et cetera. And I went out a couple times to do that in the city of Greenwood. I never went out into the, into the country. And that was another thing. There were some white people who felt limited by the fact that they couldn't play a dominant role. And I always felt, well, wait, you know, I'm not from here, number one. I don't know the terrain. I don't really know the people and the culture. And it's also not safe for black and white people to be seen together in, in a prominent kind of way. So I can remember times when we rode in cars across the South and either the black people sit in the back or the, or, and the whites in front or vice versa. And then if you were going through a tough area, you would have a blanket. If you were the white people in the back and there were black drivers, you would have a blanket over you and, the, and you'd be on the floor in the back or vice versa. So, you know, those, those were the differences. Atlanta, you didn't have to hide. 
um, you know, you didn't have to uh, uh, claim that you weren't mixing, you weren't race mixers, right? But um, but you you still had to be cautious. You had to be careful. But it wasn't the same thing as in rural Mississippi or rural Alabama, where you had to really be clear about and there were like times where people were stopped in the middle of the night and so their their danger level was just much higher in the summer of 64 I mean, but again you you were right in the in the the heat of the of the struggle and you were like right up against death and and uh intense white supremacy and racism and everything else so you were like you were feeling this every every single day so Yeah, so one of the things I think for me going from Atlanta to Mississippi, I mean, I've, I'm only been, I've only been in the South three months myself, but I think there's a level on which I must have absorbed the messages from the field staff about the cautionary um, feelings they had about white students flooding into their projects. Because I can remember an incident in the Greenwood office where the white volunteers were writing the pamphlets or the leaflet, leaflets for encouraging people to come out. And I can remember attention from some of the black field staff and or black community people like, like, well, let us do that. Like, why are they taking over type of thing? So I think early on I had this sense of, and I, because I was a very dutiful, kind of conservative on some level person, I didn't want to, I, I was very aware I didn't want to do anything that would um, put myself in, in the center or put myself in conflict with the, the black community and the black field workers that were wel had welcomed me with open arms and believed that I could be trusted and that I would be respectful. So um, I can remember uh, I can remember toward the end of the summer, and one of the geniuses of SNCC was that we had this incredible organizational structure. So Foreman, Jim Foreman was the, he was the political mastermind or the organizational mastermind, and there were these big debates about what we called Freedom High versus structure. I was in the structure faction which my view was you had to have structure in order to have program. The Freedom High folks, and this I'm simplifying this terribly, the Freedom High folks were mostly you have to let people do what they want to do and that the program will evolve in that way. And I'm like, no, you need some structure, you need some, because I had seen the lack of fairness, I think. I had seen the, which we see today, the, the community that yells the loudest gets the most resources. The community that has the most privilege you know, is deferred to more. So I had seen that, and and uh, certainly when I got back to Atlanta in the fall of '64, the Alabama field staff and the Georgia field staff and the Arkansas field staff were very jealous of the Mississippi staff because they felt the Mississippi staff got everything, and so they would call me. I'm the northern coordinator. I'm the big fundraising guru, right? I, I, I mean, I didn't have control of the funds. That was the executive committee, but. But by the same token, they would call me and they would say, we need this or we need that. Can, what can you do to help us? And so I would be able to carry their message of what they needed. But I can remember also writing, I think it was, I think it was Jim's idea in the fall of 64. So after Freedom Summer is over and 99% of the volunteers go north. So there's a big debate, first of all, about adding white volunteers to the staff in the fall. There's lots of debate about that. How many, and some people say that the organization became more white than black, and that's not true. That was never the case. If you look at the lists of staff and you count black versus white, white people never dominated. And definitely white people never dominated in the core leadership, never. So um, uh, anyway, so in the fall, I, can, I think Jim, it was Jim's idea to have something called a freedom force. And this was, you know, he, he wanted to have a Black Belt summer project that would be Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, 
uh, Georgia, etc. And he that was his idea for ne the next summer, for 65 summer. And he was turned down by the, the rest of the staff, or the executive committee anyway, that that was just too wild, too enormous. And Jack Minnis, who was, that was another thing, SNCC had a research department. And uh, Jack Minnis, who Judy always describes him as this crusty old guy, could get, uh, could get uh, information from a, from a stone, right? So he, I guess he used libraries because we did not have the internet. We did not have uh, anything like that. So you had to go to the library and pull out these old dusty volumes of, you know, population statistics or registration statistics or whatever to the extent that they were accurate. But anyway, um, so Jim's idea of this for this Black Belt project, I can remember the maps uh, showing where the communities would be in the in each of the states and what the data was, what the what the population data was, and what the voter registration data was, and so on. But by the same in the same period of time, Jim concocted this thing called the Freedom Force. I think I'm right about that, the name. But anyway, the idea was that there would be these white volunteers who had returned to the North, and they would adopt a project. And they would then, you know, raise money, and they would send things south. And that was a very good idea in general because it took advantage of the passion and the relationships that the volunteer had with their Mississippi communities. But I can remember writing a memo, and I'll try to dig this up and send it uh, to a guy in Iowa who was going to br bring a car down. He wasn't going to turn the car over to the project. He was going to be the sole driver. Uh, he was going to bring supplies down, so he would. Be, the idea I was that was repugnant to me was that he would be the center. He would be the giver of all these gifts, and he would be the center. He was centering himself. He was a white Iowan. He, you know, was like a guy, right? And and he had no concept of being, um, no concept of being respectful, of having boundaries, of not putting his ego out there as the as the dominant force. And I remember writing to him, and I have that memo somewhere, um, about how, and I didn't call it white privilege at the time, because I don't think we use those terms, but it was, that was what it was. It was a critique of his whiteness and his privilege, his ideas of privilege and, and what he could do. And so I argued very hard for him to turn over all of those resources to the project, for him to get the car yes that was important but to turn it over not to be the 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 giver and then they're therefore the holder of all these gifts right so so yeah so white privilege was rampant and white supremacy was rampant and we did use the word the terms white supremacy but i but i think we thought about it in terms of the white citizens councils and the clan i don't think we understood the implications of structure and how deeply embedded white supremacy and privilege are in the structures that the country operates under or operated under at the time and, and even and then op continues to operate under so so okay to be a young woman uh, again I was very um, you know I was like a worker bee I, I don't think I, I wasn't very I was very um, friendly, I, you know, I built relationships and friendships with people. I was very loyal. I was, but I was a worker bee, and so I did my work. And um, the, you know, there were guys that tried to hit on me. There, I can, I can think of some examples. There were some guys that I really loved um, in a way, but I was very hesitant to get into sexual relationships because I saw the complications. I saw some of the drama that happened when somebody ditch somebody or somebody had two relationships. I think for me it was just the, the, the political impact of what I was doing. I felt so, and I didn't understand what being part of history really meant, but Foreman used to tell us, write it down, you're part of history. And yes, okay, so we understood we were part of history on some level, and we were like breaking new ground, and we were cutting edge on a lot of levels because SNCC was, you know, we were the radical uh, force. So I kind of knew, I kind of knew that on some level, but I, but I believed in what I was doing so much that I, that wasn't the forefront. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm part of history, you know, look at me. You know, and I didn't keep notes, actually. I, I kept some notes, which I still have, of staff meetings, but very little. Because little. Judy Richardson was our, 
our secretarial person. She did shorthand and she, she kept all these fabulous minutes and she's got, you know, pe what people said at every meeting and that kind of thing. And those are in the, the Crim Vets, arch the Civil Rights Movement Vets archive and in SNCC Digital, you'll see a lot of those documents. And, and actually, I think Foreman's genius of keep records, make sure that the field secretaries don't get their paycheck until they f turn in a field report. Some of those field reports are incredibly rich. And we wouldn't have that if Foreman hadn't had that organizational vision and understood that we were in a historical period that was unmatched. I mean, we wouldn't have the scholarship that we have for, um, for people writing. It's the most written about period in American history. And I don't know if that's partly to do with the burgeoning in, in college, uh, uh, college students and graduate students who are studying history and politics, or whether that's because it was it, because it was more recent and there was TV documentation and you know more all those archives are much more accessible, or whether it's you know how much Jim's genius of keep records, write it down, write field reports contributed to that, which I'm sure it was wasn't. Um, you know, it wasn't a small part of it. And the, the genius of somebody like a Julian Bond and Dottie and others who built relationships with the media, who therefore enabled them to see inside of a movement process that normally you cover it from the, the street on the demonstration, but you don't necessarily get the depth of, your, of, of, your, of the passion and the, and, the, and the background that goes into how did you, how did you do this? How did you get 300 people to come to the, to the courthouse in, in Greenwood, Mississippi on, in July 1964, which there was a big Freedom Day in Greenwood, that that was the time where I was determined to get arrested because I hadn't been arrested yet. And <laughs> I was determined to get arrested and I told everybody I was gonna be arrested and I went to the Freedom Day and then I chickened out and went back to the office and covered it from, you know, covered it from the office and helped with bailing people out and that kind of thing. So. So after the summer in Greenwood at the national office, we closed the national office prior to the, the Mississippi challenge. And we all go to Atlantic City to support the Mississippi Freedom Democrats. And we stay in a motel and we were out on the boardwalk every day or we're, we're producing documents or we're, we're helping to go and lobby delegates or, or whatever it is that we're assigned. So there was a, a Mississippi challenge staff in DC that leads the work in Atlantic City. So those of us who come from the South, who come from the SNCC staff, we're basically, we're the, the, the leg, we do the legwork for them, whatever it is, whether it's mimeographing, and you know, we used to have those big mimeograph machines where you type a blue stencil and you put it on a drum and it would, you, I mean, the corrections were impossible, but you would stand for hours cranking the mimeograph machine or, or, the, or the duplicating the purple, purple print on the white slick paper. So you would, be, you would be doing that. Whatever it was, you did it. And, um, you know, you, you gathered to see the, the speeches that, that were made at the Credentials Committee and heard Ms. Ms. Hamer. I was in the room when um, the compromise, the so-called compromise was offered up to the Mississippi Freedom Democrats. And I can remember Ms. Hamer standing up and said, we didn't come to Mississippi for no two seats. I mean, they were, people were visibly angry and very disappointed because they had, they believed that the government, the country would support them, and the country did not. And so they went home to Mississippi, pretty angry, pretty upset. We go back to Atlanta after uh, Atlantic City and reopen, not reopen, because there had always been an office in Atlanta. So we, we go back to Atlanta and we reconfigure our work. Dinky Romilly, who had been the Northern Coordinator, moves to New York. I take over as the lead Northern Coordinator. There's a new staff. There's a woman named Cynthia Washington who, who comes. Uh, Esther Heifetz, she comes. Margaret Herring, then Lauren, Margaret Lauren. They come and they, we work on the staff. and we, we write all the thank you notes. We hand write thank you notes to people who send us money. We, um, we send out um, 
Friends of SNCC newsletters as often as we can, detailing what's been happening in the South. But we, we are always talking politics. We're not saying, oh, these poor, poor people in Mississippi or these poor Alabama people, or guess what happened? Somebody got beaten up and, oh, isn't your heart just bleeding for them? No, we were about, we have to change the country. We have to change the structure. We have to convert the Senate. We have to get these Southern Democrats out of office. Uh, so that, that, actually, that's a really interesting perspective to look back on, okay, we thought that country was really going to change if we got rid of the Southern Democrats. Of course, they became Southern Republicans, right? Um, we, thought that, we thought if black people got the right, many of us thought, let's put it this way, uh, because certainly I became much more of a, of a revolutionary. I worked in the anti-war movement, and then I came to Baltimore to work in a factory in the 70s. And, and thinking that if we got the working class committed to transforming the country, that that would be the way to go. Uh, of course, that, that's all history. But uh, anyway, uh, we really thought the country was going to change as a result because we were looking at the right to vote as the premier sy symbol of how do you participate in American democracy, understanding that it ain't just about the vote, that it's much, it's much bigger than that that it has to not only is it about the vote and not only is it about electing people to office but it's about changing the structures and changing people's thinking what's ethical what's fair i mean going back to the to the iowa the young man that i wrote to in iowa that was another thing that was making me think was we have to be and the and the personnel committee the structures that snick set up how do we how do we bring fairness and and justice into these structures? How do we make sure that one project doesn't get something that another doesn't? How do we make sure that somebody who asks to be transferred gets listened to and heard? How do we make sure that somebody who wants to go off and do a, some special work gets to do it? And it's not just the white people, but it's African-American staff members, it's local people. How do we, how do we honor and respect our bigger our bigger family and make sure that the resources are distributed equitably and fairly. So, so that was part of the, um, you know, part of what we are imagining is that, of course, the right to vote would, would, you know, bring freedom to the country. But, you know, but then also there was a, a disappointment in the fall of 64 because the Democratic Party did not honor their commitment to the Mississippi Freedom Democrats and because they did not uh, I mean, certainly later on, they put language in their in their convention statutes and stuff like that that the delegations had to be representative, but they didn't do it right there in '64. So we come back from from Atlantic City and we're like, okay, so what's the SNCC direction now? Like, what what do we do? So we did this congressional challenge. We did, I did uh, in in not until '65, but I did a lot of uh, in the fall of '65 a lot of research into federal programs that were being administered in a discriminatory way. So the, agri the ASCS, the Agricultural Stabilization, ASCS crop allotment, it was about crop allotments and so black farmers didn't get the same crop allotments that white farmers got. Certainly black young people didn't get the same school uh, access that white kids got. Uh, food stamp access, all of the federal programs that were administered in the South were done in a very discriminatory way. So that all of those structures had to be upended and crit critiqued and then legislation, slow process to get, to get everything right, aligned. And even now, here we are, 60 years later, not everything is aligned and not everything is structurally transformed. I don't think we understood the, the intensity of the, of the need for, for struggle to continue either. Julian was always uh, somebody that you looked up to, that you idolized, that you, I, I mean, I was always very flattered that I knew him, that he would, rec same with John Lewis, right? That he would see me in a, in a room and he would say, hi, Betty. And Julian the same way. How are you doing? What's up? Where are you living now? That kind of thing. Um, and so it was always, it always was fabulous that people like um, Julian and John Lewis and others became national figures 
and were catapulted onto the national stage and they could talk about their passion for racial justice and how they came through their process and, and, and that kind of thing. And I know Julian, um, at one point I participated in some, when he was the NAACP chair, I participated in some of their, their national meetings and that was always great. And, and you know, I, again, he, I went to lecture in his class in, at University of Virginia so that was another piece of respect was how Julian was really communicating the uh, information about the movement, the black freedom movement to younger people and how he, he was very creative in his curriculum development and so on. It was so it was thrilling to me that he lived in, that he taught at UVA and he taught at AU and uh, he lived in DC. So I saw him often at SNCC reunion meetings or SNCC events like the, event that we just had, the SNCC Legacy Project just had an event honoring Jim Foreman. So there have been, and then as people have passed away, there have been, of course, moments in history where you've had to come together to, to, to mourn someone's passing, but also to lift up the, the fabulousness of their life, you know, and, and the contribution that they made. So I know my daughter and I, after Julian passed in August of what, 2015? 2005, 2000, 2015. 2015. I knew there was a five in there, right? <laughs> so after Julian passed in, in August of 2015, one of the things people were encouraged to do was to put flowers in water. And so we, my daughter and I, who knew him also, um, we went down to the Baltimore Harbor and we released flowers on whatever that day was. I think it was like two or three days later, we went and we released flowers in Julian's memory and we talked about how we knew him and and you know our our um, our connection and sadness at his loss, but at the same time, you know the fabulous contributions that he'd made. So, so. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Wow, this was just.